All right, welcome to Herberger Online Office Hours uh, for the summer of 2020, where the goal is to bring together faculty members and instructional designers to talk about relevant issues in online teaching and learning in higher ed. Today, we're talking about an article from the State Press called, an opinion article called, You Don't Hate Zoom Lectures, You Just Hate Lectures. Um, so we'll be talking about that. I'm Tim McKean, instructional designer for the Herberger Institute of Design and the Arts at ASU. Let's meet our other participants. Hi, I'm Mary Loader. I'm an instructional design specialist with ASU Online. I'm Linda Herdan. I'm an instructional designer at W.P. Carey School of Business. Great. Nice to have you, Mary and Linda. Um, so the article uh, poses this idea that where there's been a lot of pushback around Zoom lecturing, um, and just there's, you've probably seen other articles about this idea of Zoom fatigue and things like that. Um, and, but the article kind of poses a different perspective that maybe it's not Zoom that's the problem. Maybe it's lecturing that's the problem. Um, and we'll go to Linda, because in our, in our pre-chat, you, you mentioned that you had a specific cons concern about, about the author's concern. Right. Uh, um... I was one of the people when I went to school, I liked lecture. Um, and of course, there are different qual uh, qualities and different instructors are better at it than others. Uh, one thing I did think about with reading the article was it were students not interested in the lecture or were they just didn't do the pre-work so they didn't able to keep along? Also, I found it interesting, the author mentioned the distractions available, because of course, if you're on Zoom, you're at a computer. But nowadays, of course, we have mobile devices, which wasn't the case before. Mm -hmm. um, so how much is it students don't like lectures or how, rather than they rather be doing something else? So I think you just can't put it all on that it's a boring lecture. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think there's some consideration too, to like, you know, when you're in the classroom, that's your space, you know, that space, your confidence shines through. And then for a lot of faculty, they moved over in a very short time to Zoom and Zoom isn't hard to use, but there are some learning curves that you have to overcome. And so to be distracted by the learning curves, to have a reduced sense of confidence and to have to present in that vein, that can sometimes lead to, um, an uninspired experience because the faculty is really concerned with technology, which is a reasonable place to be, especially in the short time frame that they were expected to be giving lectures online. So I, I have a lot of heart for faculty in that space because it's just, it wasn't a space they were used to. I mean, moving forward, people are going to become better online facilitators, better webinar deliverers, because in some of these, it is a webinar, um, but there are some very specific strategies people can use to engage individuals that are watching their lectures. And these are strategies that we already use in the online space through you know, different technology pieces like PlayPosit or just having shorter lectures, um, little micro sessions instead of long sessions and having moments to pause and reflect and soak in reference to the experience and what that lecture meant to them and how they can connect things. So it just feel for them because yeah, the Zoom experience is not the best experience if you're not used to delivering things online and you're not used to having like an online personality. And if you're not used to deploying very specific strategies while leveraging what the technology can do. Yeah, and that's one of the things that we keep coming back to is this idea that, um, that what we're doing now is a whole new thing. And teaching online is a different skill than teaching in person. And you, you mentioned that comfort with your classroom that I talked with an instructor today who was talking about how she gets so much energy from the students and, and kind of feeds off of them and knows you know what tangents to take or what roads to follow down based on what they're responding to. And, and that idea that when you're lecturing, uh, even in Zoom, but also just to a camera, which I think is what the author is kind of posing as the alternative, right? To, to not doing Zoom lectures, but maybe um, asynchronous recordings, which we'll get to a little bit more. That that's a whole different skill of talking to a camera um, and, and kind of staying on the course uh, than, than what a lot of instructors were trained up in and have that comfort level with. I know what, 
one thing we've talked about and we haven't implemented it, but um, saying that some instructors are much better in the classroom. They come across more naturally. Also, again, is, is one of the weaknesses of recorded lectures is, and I tell this to my instructors, is what questions do your students have in class? Uh, but on the flip side of it is we're always telling instructors no more than 10 minutes, no more than 15 minutes. And so how do you get that feedback from students whether or not they're lost? Because I think if you think about it, I've had, there are a few classes where the lecturer, the professor basically talked the entire time. But I think almost every single one of them is somebody asked a question. And you would clarify it. You maybe got, maybe it's not so much on a side discussion, but then the instructor would be able to bring out, yeah, well, this is this, or this is why it's important. Mm -hmm. And unless you have a great instructor who really knows the material and has done it in class enough, it's really hard to put that into a recording. And then again, does it apply to that student that's listening to it or to that class? And it's, it can be very difficult and I, I don't, we're not there yet. I think one thing that's interesting and we're looking at interesting is what comes up when we do these synchronous lectures? What do we learn from it? Because I think right now we're sort of either all one side or all the other side, either all in person or all pre-recorded. Yeah, I agree. And I think Tim made a good point, right? Online is not the same as remote. There are different strategies you take when you move a course online. Sometimes you don't need to be the sage on the stage anymore. There might be a composition of, of other sages that you want to use um, and their own materials or uh, different kinds of like documentaries, things that help you get your point across without you having to be the only person who has that knowledge. And I think there's some value there and some diversity of consumption that helps with that in the online space. And I think it's really important when we start thinking of like a sync or a high flex experience that we use those synchronous spaces for reflection work where we can share ideas rather than the passive consumption work because that's not really what that space is meant to be, especially in an online environment. It's not meant to be one person talking at everyone. That would be a webinar. That's different than an online class. So I think experience sharing is missed when um, we're using it as a one-way communication tool for lectures. And one conversation I had even with just a, another faculty member today was this idea that great lecturers engage their students throughout the lecture, right? And as, as Mary just said, you rarely have a, a two hour monologue, um, but rather there's interactions, there's Q&A, there might be a, a breakout discussion, you know, turn to your neighbor, ask them, talk about this, uh, raise your hand if you agree with this, there's polling, there's a lot of engagement that happens in a live classroom. And what we don't realize as we're doing it, or instructors that are comfortable teaching in that environment, is that they're really, they really already are lecturing for five or 10 minutes at a time, and then doing something else. Um, and so it, it, sometimes it makes, it's hard to make them realize they're already doing the right thing, mm -hmm. but they're doing it all back to back to back to back synchronously. And because that's the way they learned, that's the way they've they've had the most experience. Um, but when you really analyze what you're doing in the classroom, there's probably a five minute presentation and then some questions and then another story and then um, some Q&A or some discussion. And what, what we wanna do when we're moving to this blended model, a um, couple of terms have come up um, with hybrid or high flex modes, which are learning to make a nice, uh, blend of synchronous and asynchronous activities. As we move some of that to the asynchronous realm, um, then, then, we, then we can start to see that that's where the value for students comes in the flexibility. So the lecture that you're already giving might already be perfect. It just needs to be chunked out to here's a presentation on this and then I have a discussion board and then here's a, another presentation or another story about this uh, anecdote that illustrates a point and if we break those out into to separate recordings that allow and allow students to consume those at their schedule and at, and at their availability, then when you do those synchronous times, when you've asked students to come together at a particular time or 
uh, when campus is open again in a specific location, you're maximizing the value of that uh, synchronicity. Uh, you're maximizing the value of the sacrifice that that person has made to be there at that time at that place by giving, using the whole time for discussion, using the whole time for Q&A and, and things like that. And that's one of the ways that I really see um, some added value in the asynchronous, even though they're, they're still lectures in the asynchronous uh, mini lectures, I guess a lot of people are using that term. I think, though, what you're thinking about is the flipped. And from my understanding, it is, like I said, the sync is sort of, well, sync right now, from what I understand, it's sort of almost a backup plan um, that we're sort of getting into it just in case we have to go full or remote. But also is one way is that it gives students flexibility, like if they can't be there that night. So almost you're almost thinking of you expect students to be there in every session and sometimes they can't. And so in that case, you're not really talking about a flipped classroom. You're just almost talking, making things where how you present things in class, you can also have the equivalent or certain things also online. So if a student misses a day in class, they're still able to keep up. But yeah. going to something what Mary said, she said they don't need to be the sage on the stage. That reminded me of an article I read a few years ago where, um, report of the demographics of online students. And one thing we keep hearing is our ASU online students tend to be older. Um, they've been out of school for a few years. And then another thing I read in it depends on where you come from, but other students who do online courses don't have as much academic preparation. Uh, they're either working or, uh, as I said, one school mentioned that sometimes is the students with the highest GPA to register early and they register for the online or the in-person classes. And so then is it the fault of the medium or is it that that medium does not work with that demographic? Because the numbers is if you look, and again, a lot of our online courses, at least our I courses, of course, are the 200, 300 level ones where we have two, 300 people. There's just such a high demand. Um, can I would think it the results of doing online lectures would be different if you had one, of course, an interesting instructor who was good at doing online lectures, but then also what if your students were academically prepared and interested in the topic? Would they have as much problems as we hear from others? So, you know, it's also the fact that the, the students in online courses tend to be a bit different and they have a lot of times more challenges in an academic setting. And then when you put onto that, the asynchronous part of it, I think there, it, so again, it's, it's not one thing. And it's yeah. just not break everything up in 10 minutes and it'll be work fine. Yeah, and I really like that when you think about how you're providing the same experience, but in different ways that they can access it. What a wonderful nod to universal design for learning. Mm -hmm. So now we're moving people into a space in this high flex model where, yes, the lecture could be done synchronously and then they could record it and they could put it online. And what a blessing that is to students who have to have that flexibility to be successful. And now it's not only available to online students, right? This time of COVID has really made a stretch. And I think to the students advantage, and there are faculty who have had negative experiences for sure. It, this was a really high stress time period. Online and even remote learning is hard to facilitate with a three day turnaround. And that's about what most universities were looking at. So uh, when you have more time, you have more time to be intentional. When you have the, the passion, it reads. When you create the intentional space for reflection, the students feel cared for, like they can share their experiences, which is also a very universal design for learning methodology and strength of teaching. And then as some of our faculty experienced, you know, they weren't exactly happy to move online, but they had more capacity to be there for their students. So yeah, the class ended in an hour, but people stuck around. They were asking questions now that they maybe wouldn't have had an opportunity to ask because there's just a more one-to-one -one experience in the online world. You feel like you're better able to express your questions. Um, feel like you have a closer connection to your teacher because you're not competing with everybody because you all have access to the same chat. So it's just a completely different experience and I think really positive for some people. Mm -hmm. Really, It's good to note that Though this was hard, though people were under a ton of stress and it was not the preference, um, 
there were some really good wins from this experience as well. Yeah, and I've heard a couple of uh, articles and a couple of podcasts interviewing other uh, professors. And one of the comments that keeps coming back from various different sources is, I've had more one-to-one -one interactions with my students this semester than ever before in my career. And I, and I thought that was an interesting that, that while the group dynamic was taken away, what it was left with was this more personal connection at a one-to-one -one level and, and kind of the leveling of the playing field that a platform, uh, a virtual platform does is no one's in the back row anymore. And that's an, an, an interesting idea. Um, you know, if you think about these large lecture hall classes where some, some people are in the front row, some people are hundreds of feet back um, and that's a very different experience to be in the back of a lecture versus the front of a lecture, uh, as far as the ability to ask questions or the ability to give even nonverbal uh, feedback to the to the lecturer. Um, and the idea that that when everyone's on the literally the same plane, um, that it, it flattens a lot of things and gives a lot of people the same experience. Um, versus where the classroom might have been uh, less effective. And that's one of the, art, the points that the article brings up is, um, were in-person lectures really that effective to start with? And, and um, I'm gonna share my screen for a second here um, because it reminds me of this picture. <laughs> where, you know, does this look like a lot of the classrooms I've seen where, you know, the, the author of the article talks about distractions uh, and a lot of faculty are really concerned about students who are multitasking uh, during, during class sessions. Um, but that's not new. That's not new to the online platform. Students are distracted and, and multitasking potentially in their in-person classes as well. Um, so, you know, how does that dynamic kind of play in and how do we continue to uh, build a more effective instructional environment using the tools we have is one of the things that that, that gets me to think about. Yeah, I think that, that stage to audience structure, it's very circular, right? So that hierarchy is gone, which is actually quite lovely. I think also another thing that we need to remember is that in addition to how the students have changed in the classroom, you know, they may not be as academically prepared. There's all these distractions now. They're busier. Um, now, significant numbers have a job that they financially depend on. It's no longer just some extra money or they're able to easily pay tuition with a part-time job. But also now is a lot of, you don't have the faculty support or support for the faculty you do. I remember when I went to school, I believe almost every full-time faculty member had a graduate assistant. They had someone there to assist them. And I don't think there is many, like, you know, now there's so much uh, pressure on them to perform, to, you know, to br bring in the money. And so a lot of instructors, even I think even in their in-person classes, I think they're stretched more than they used to be in the past. And then when you put on the new technology and now you do have to create things, create some new things for online or even synchronous. And I think that's where we need to be helpful for university and colleges to create that pool of items or even ideas to make it easily available. Because I think now sometimes what we find is we're searching online or searching or asking around trying to find how do you do this? How's the best way to do this? Or just some, maybe some other ideas. Because um, again, like I saying, it's online still does, at least we know with our I courses, they do have a, a, a less successful rate of student completion than regular in-person courses. Yeah, and I'm glad you got you brought up that point. You mentioned it earlier, that idea of uh, medium. I wrote it down. Let me just see how I wrote it down again. Medium versus demographics. Is it, you know, is there an issue there between the medium and the demographics? And I think one of the things that's interesting, at least in this very specific context right now, is um, at ASU, the online division has always been kind of separate, right? We have the, the what we call O courses, which are completely asynchronous online courses um, and are part of generally um, completely online 
uh, degree programs. And then we do have some online courses that are meant for our, our local population. We call those I courses. Um, but now for the first time ever, we're looking at instructional design and we're looking at course development and we're looking at how every course is implementing um, and, and addressing students remotely and, and online. And so, the, so it, right now in this situation, our demographic has changed completely because, uh, and, and I was kind of talking to, to Mary about this before we recorded, is you know, those uh, instructors and those students who are part of ASU online and, and in my division, those uh, instructors who are teaching I courses, those fully online courses, not a whole lot has changed for them, right? You know, for those online students, nothing's really changed. For the online instructors, nothing's really changed. What's really changed right now is all the uh, faculty who have only taught in person and all the students who have only studied in person now being asked to, to make a change and, and do that. Um, so it's interesting to, to think of that is the demographic is different now. We're not talking about what was previously the typical online student. Now we're talking about student, you know, um, and, and not making that online designation for, for the demographic or the, the subset of population. Um, and I think that's one of the challenges is uh, what works for a large number of people, you know, and, and again, these are probably students that didn't, that haven't specifically chosen online courses. They've been moved to online courses or remote or sync or uh, high flex. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that the flexibility is so important because we can't make any one thing that fits everybody, right? The analogy of one size fits all clothing comes to mind of, one size fits all just means it fits everybody as poorly, right? I mean, that's all that means. It doesn't actually fit anybody uh, or there might be a person. Um, but we can't, so we can't make courses that are equally bad for everybody. That's not, you know, that's not the goal either. Um, and so that flexibility of, um, and with high flex, we'll talk more about high flex next week. I found a good article that we'll, that I'll look, I'll share out. Um, but with high flex, the idea is giving students some some agency, some choice in and preference of how they participate. So am I a person that uh, enjoys that real time lecture and, and wants to be there, you know, at, in the moment? Or am I a person that would rather watch a recording uh, and answer and ask my questions in a in a chat or something like that? Or am I, um, you know, do is my life in such a situation where I might need that one week? I might want to come to class one week, but not to be available the next week or things like that. So I hope, I hope that, that as we continue this conversation, um, that the idea of flexibility comes in, into, into mind. Yeah, and I, you brought up a good point about the um, expectations, because that's one thing you keep hearing about is how a lot of students, you know, as even before ASU went to remote, one student in the university said, if I wanted to take an online class, I would have signed up for an online class. And now you're hearing about a lot of students are hesitant about taking courses in fall, especially if they are going to more expensive uh, residential schools. Um, but when you mentioned like a perfect example, as I support an instructor, she was teaching two courses uh, very similar, uh, just slightly different audiences. One was online, one was in person. The in-person, of course, had to go remote. And she was saying her online students, she didn't notice any difference. Mm -hmm. uh, her in-person students were struggling. And to keep this in perspective is both courses were graduate level courses. So these were students who were academically prepared. Mm -hmm. And these were students who probably had experience. They were professionals. They had experience with technology. Yet the group that had like three days to find out they're going their next course, their next courses are going to be online, were struggling. And this is a big thing now with sync that's different is, you know, we've always said, well, you can't replicate the in-person, the residential experience online. And a lot of those students aren't looking for it because they're not, you know, ASU, they're not local students. But right. now with the sync courses. Yeah, you do want to replicate because again, you're now some of those sync courses, some of those students may be aimed at where they can't get to class that night or they don't already know that those three chapters pretty well. So they don't think they need to come to class those few weeks. 
but you still want to give them the same experience as the students you do in your regular, who are there in the classroom. So that's going to be completely new. And I mm -hmm. know very few people who have experience with that. Well, and I think it's important when you think about online students versus our campus-based population that online students sign up for it, they have the technology available. They have intentionally created a time management schedule that fits online. Uh, Campus-based are trying to adopt time management skills that they didn't necessarily get any kind of training on. Our online students get training on time management. That's a part of this program at ASU Online. And we know that they have computers. They know they need the computers. They know they need consistent Wi-Fi access. And that just wasn't true of campus space. So we're all going through a stretch period. You know, I think it's so weird. I mean, I get it. I get why people are mad if they were in campus space courses that they had to move online. But I wish people could see the benefit of it because especially after this COVID ex experience, businesses are going to change. If they didn't already, remote is a thing. Like it's just part of what they're gonna go into after college. So what a benefit to them to be able to go through the experience that they're then gonna have to enter in the workforce. That was something that I noticed when I worked for a corporate training company. We had everything face-to-face -face for decades. And it was a really great program. Won awards, awesome. But when we moved them online, not only did it save the company money, which was I think one of the primary reasons we did it, but secondary, an outcome they didn't expect was that the employee's efficacy improved dramatically. Not only did it become an active learning environment where they were using real tools that they would use in their real jobs right away on the first day, but they just understood how to have that explorative learning experience. They knew how to engage in a way that was going to be indicative of the job that they were going into. So I know it's hard. Change is hard. We had a little, little so little time to change. But overall, the students who move from campus-based online and that persevere through mm -hmm. and continue to take more classes like that, they're going to be better prepared in the workplace. That's just a thing. I think you bring up the point because I know um, before I worked where I did, I worked at the help desk at ASU and we would get a lot of calls from ASU online students and a lot of them are not prepared for online education. And, you know, one thing I keep hearing from the instructors I support, and it's not only ASU, it's, it's higher education nationwide, is students are coming to uh, college universities without the necessary writing and thinking skills um, and learning skills. And now is we have to add to that is, like you said, some students have hard times doing this stuff online when they don't have that synchronous in-person environment. Um, how are we going to offer help to them when we, a lot of times we don't have sufficient help or they don't ask for sufficient, they're not sufficiently asking for help for their in-person courses. Yeah, I think that's a culture issue, right? And so what, what's nice for our ASU online students is they have their success coaches. So if they know the right method of communication, they're not gonna call the help desk. They'll call their success coaches who are very well trained in how to get them the right resources to help them really develop the right skills but often they don't even know the right place to call. So, you know, it's all about training a student on how to be a good student, 100%. And this is now just showing the gaps we need to fill. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's helping us see the opportunity so we know how to address it to make a better student going forward. Yeah, and I like Mary's point about training a student to be a good online student or just to, to be an online student. Again, we talked earlier about how uh, being an online teacher is a different job. Being an online student is a different job as well. And I think another thing that, that we can come back to is this idea of course design, is that course design is much more important as we move online. And, and Linda, you alluded to this as well, that, that the same teachers teaching the same courses um, in person and, and online, when, when they moved everybody synchron uh, synchronous, when they moved everybody remote, those courses that were built to be in person didn't do as well um, because they were designed differently. They were designed to be in person. And then, and that course design for our online or sync or remote modalities needs to be intentional. And I think one of the, the, the trends that I'm hearing coming back from faculty is that in person is easier to, to do. It's easier to do along the way and yeah. time, kind of make up as you go. Um, online and any even like an online hybrid or a sync um, can't be made up as you go. It needs to be planned. It needs to be designed. Uh, and things need to be in place from the beginning with the, with the correct preparation for the students 
and the instructor um, to, to move forward from that. I yeah, think there's also a distinction to be made between good online and bad online. Um, <laughs> we, we talked about um, you know, students complaining about their schools moving to sync. I don't know if I've, um, all the articles that I've seen or the majority of the articles that I've seen, none of them have been particularly the ASU students. And I'm wondering about you know, what their experience was. The people that are really complaining and that are bringing lawsuits to get back their tuition and things like that, was it, was it did they have the same experience that our students had? Or you know, is, there a, is there a distinction there to be made uh, to the schools that did a better job or a lesser job moving, moving remotely? I know that Herberger, um, Haida enrollment is up 17% for summer um, over last year. And, and so, you know, the, and we may see at ASU, the schools that have a good foundation in online learning and have a good support for their faculty to make this necessary pivot uh, to sync or, or online hybrids, whatever they turn out to be, uh, will be the schools where the students come to because instead of having a Band-Aid approach, at least there's something that's a little bit more intentional. So hopefully that's a good thing that all of our viewers and, and that all of our, our units here at ASU are considering is that idea that quality will bring the students. I, I like what something you mentioned, because uh, we saw again also at uh, the business school is um, some of the courses that already had online components did better. But also what we see is a lot is for some of our instructors, especially our newer instructors or adjunct instructors, will copy an online version for their in-person. And we had a lot of instructors who say they like that because everything's there. Mm -hmm. I know for one adjunct instructor, when we designed the course, it's an in-person course, but we designed it very similar to a uh, online course as is where everything's already in there and everything's already in the modules in the weeks. And it's very easy for them to keep track of things. And I think there is, and for I've heard is, is that we're trying also to encourage our instructors, uh, even our in-person instructors to uh, maximize the usefulness of the LMS, mm -hmm. to use it in a more effective way. Again, like they're saying is these lectures where it's very factual and not very many questions. Again, the, the flipped aspect. Mm -hmm. There's certain things that you can move online. Yep. Because um, I noticed in the past year with Canvas, now that, because I think Canvas is a bit easier for them to use, is some instructors are now moving some more quizzes or some exams online to free up that class time. Yeah. yeah I think that you guys both made good points. Like, it's like our in person classes are improvisation artists, they can read the audience, they know how to adjust their techniques, right? You don't have that luxury in online. So it's really important to be very intentional in your design. And what's nice is now we have time. So it's now is the time to be intentional and prepare for a high flex environment because high flex isn't going away. It didn't start because of COVID. It started because of California students not being able to get to class on time due to traffic. That's <laughs> due to jobs, yeah. So it's going to continue and our workforce is going to become more remote. People need to step in, lean in and start getting intentional in their planning. Excellent. Yeah, and I and to echo that, I I think that the the hybrid, the high flex, um, or what ASU is calling sync, is going to have incredible value. Um, I think it's I think it finds the happy middle ground between between things, right? Uh, the flexibility and and the convenience of having some things asynchronous, uh, like some of those direct instruction pieces, reading assignments, check for understanding quizzes. It doesn't matter if I do those at the same time as other people, but then still being able to get together for a Q&A session or a discussion with my instructor, with my peers, uh, brings the best of those both two qualities. Mm -hmm. So I hope that's where we can continue. And like I said, next week, we're going to be talking more about uh, high flex modality specifically. Um, so I want to thank both of you for joining us today. If you're watching online and weren't in the conversation, I hope that you'll consider joining us. Uh, at some time in the future. We record uh, and meet together on Thursday afternoon, 1 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, uh, which is the same as Pacific Daylight Time because we're in Arizona and we don't follow all the rules. And uh, so hopefully you can figure that out. The link for the Zoom call uh, will be 
wherever you found this video or email me <laughs> at timothy.mckean at asu.edu and we'll get you uh, get you hooked up and uh see you next time thanks bye